Blessed are the peacemakers is going to be your first fill in the blank. Blessed are the peacemakers. It's going to be in verse number 9. You can go ahead and open up your Bibles. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 9. If you just follow along, I'll read it. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The definition here is those who resolve conflict in truth and love. Those who resolve conflict with truth and love. To make peace means to set at one again. That's what that Greek word peace is. To set at one again. In a world of division, there's a great need for peace. However, peace does not just mean the absence of conflict. Let me explain what this means. So, peace does not mean compromise. An example would be, so my wife and I are having a disagreement at home. She thinks that, you know, we should go to church, and I don't think that we should go to church, all right? She thinks we need to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And I don't think we should go at all because I think church is a complete waste of time. That's just an example, all right? <laughs> so there's discord. There's no peace right now at home, okay? So in this instance, we're going to compromise, all right? We're going to go to church just one, you know, one service instead of all three services. So that's what, now, well, now there's peace at home. We made an agreement. There's peace. Well, that's not necessarily what peace is. When there's disagreements, peace isn't just compromising and, well, I guess we'll just shoot 50-50. So when Christ was ministering, Christ was not necessarily not causing conflict with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees. He was disagreeing with them. So we would say, well, Christ isn't a peaceful person. Then. No, Christ is a peaceful person. That was Christ's ultimate goal is peace, right? But... It wasn't, he wasn't compromising anything. He was trying to create true peace, which true peace would be a world without sin, right? So in order to have true peace, it's not compromising. Also, peace does not mean covering up or excusing sin. An example that I have for this would be in the state of Oregon this, uh, in 2020. They decriminalized the use of drugs. Brother or, uh, James knows exactly what I'm talking about. In the state of Oregon, they decriminalized the use of drugs. An example would be in the state of Michigan, if you're carrying an illegal substance of the sort, of like cocaine, you get pulled over, you have cocaine on you, you're going to get arrested. In the state of Oregon, you get pulled over, if you have cocaine on you, you're not going to get arrested as long as it's not for, you're not sell, selling it. It was just for your own personal use. They decriminalized it because there are so many people getting arrested and going to jail, and we don't want people to go to jail. So the solution is that we're just going to decriminalize drugs. That, that caused peace, right? So I was showing pastors some different charts. The homicide rate in certain cities like Portland has more than tripled in two years. And that's just one city, one example of this creating peace by decriminalizing certain substances. Well, it's just a plant. You can't outlaw a plant, okay, because they just want to try to cause peace and they're going to do it in, you know, in the way that they think is possible by, well, it's not illegal, so that should cause more peace, right, by not having all these arrests, okay. That is not what the example is. Where there is sin, there cannot be peace. So we make peace by finding our peace with God in salvation. We find peace by leading others to, um, to Christ. That's where true peace is. When you have sin in your heart and in your life, there's conflict, right? There's, there's conflict in your flesh and the devil with other people and strife and envy there's conflict. The only true peace comes through Christ. So we lead other people to peace with God, and we encourage peace between other people. As Christians, we can see scripturally what the Bible says about such and such and such and such. And if we see even two Christians or two lost people having a disagreement, we can share the biblical principles and views on the situation, because where there is sin, there cannot be true peace. It doesn't mean that there's not conflict. It, it doesn't mean that there's an absence of conflict. That's not what peace is. Peace is resolving sin. 
Next slide, Brother Dave. What is the blessing for being a peacemaker? They shall be called the children of God. God is a God of peace. God is not a God of no conflict. We think of the story of Noah, or the example of Noah and building the ark. There was so much sin in the world, God, and there was so much conflict, God needed to completely remove all the moving factors except for Noah and his family. And you see pictures and you see depictions of the ark maybe resting on the mountain and all the water's gone and you see the rainbow in the sky and the animals coming off of the ark. You look at that picture and you think that's kind of like a peaceful situation. It's kind of a peaceful you know, scenario. All the animals are all getting along, coming off the ark. No one his family is saved. You have rainbow in the sky. We don't necessarily think about the millions and millions of people that just drowned, all the animals that also drowned, the earth being literally exploded from the inside out, destroying everything, and then having to rebuild. But we see in our mind, oh, the rainbow, it's God's promise that brings peace. We see no one, the animals, that brings peace. God is a God of peace. God is not a God of no conflict. So when we are like the children of God, we are peaceful. And we see that Christ made ultimate peace through his sacrifice. The absolute answer for sin and conflict is salvation. The only way that we can have salvation is through Christ. Christ is the ultimate peacemaker. Christ is the ultimate answer for sin, is his sacrifice. Next, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I'll go ahead and read. It's going to be verse number 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So I shortened it up there. I put just blessed are the persecuted. The definition here is suffering harsh treatment for acting in accordance to God's word. I think Pastor touched on this uh, a couple messages ago, talking about um, suffering for Christ or maybe getting some form of persecution for Christ. Um, I'll have Brother Dave go to the next slide. We will always face some resistance. Okay, Resistance doesn't necessarily mean persecution. When you go knock on somebody's door, say, hey, I'm Brother Kurt Rogers. I'm the assistant pastor here, Roger City Baptist Church. I just want to let you know that you're a sinner and you're going to go to hell. Okay, that... That right there is probably going to create some resistance, right? If somebody slams the door in my face, is that me being persecuted because I'm doing what's right? No. That's resistance, okay? People don't want to hear about their sin. If, if I'm walking down the street, I see somebody smoking a cigarette, just pluck that cigarette out of their mouth, put it down, stomp it out. Well, body the Lord says that your body is a temple. You're disgracing your temple, so I don't think that you should smoke. And if I get slapped upside the head, that is not persecution for doing what's right. That's just somebody just lost like $2 in a cigarette that they were enjoying. That's not me being persecuted. That's just going to be some resistance. I know that sounds like a little extreme example, but I feel like Christians will exaggerate their persecution. They'll, they'll meet some resistance, you know, passing out tracts or passing out a flyer. Somebody says, no, I'm good. They close the door. Or maybe even they're rude and say, I will never go to your church, and they close the door. That is not being persecuted. That's just meeting some resistance. Um, people don't like to feel like you're being self-righteous. If I, if I tell Brother Ben about, you know, the Lord is so, so good to me and my family, you know, I want you to have what I have. I'm going to heaven. You know, you might not be going to heaven. People are going to view that as like, oh, well, good for you. Like, you live a good life. I have a tough life. Like, Good for your self-righteous self. Like, be on your way. Again, resistance, that's not persecution. And people don't like to be told that they need something that they don't want. If you tell somebody that they're a sinner and they need salvation, they're not going to meet that with open arms. It's like telling somebody that they need a diet, okay? I'm going to look up here. <laughs> telling somebody that they need a diet. Is it, is it a fact that they probably need a diet? Yes, they do. 
But nobody likes to hear the words, you should go on a diet, Brother Gary, because it looks like you're getting a little too big for your shirt. I just picked them out because, yeah, I'm going to pay for that later. Okay, the same thing. If you, if you go to somebody and say, you're a sinner, you're in need of salvation, people are not going to respond well to, to being told that they need something that they don't have or that they don't necessarily want. But there are times where we will face some persecution. I know at the church, and I don't know all the situations, examples, stuff like that, but I know at one point our church van was stolen. Is that correct, Pastor? I think Pastor was here at the church and, and somebody called him and said, hey, you know, we've located your church van. Oh, it's dead. He said, hey, we located your church van. And you're like, yeah, it's in the parking lot, basically, is what he said. They're like, no, it's not. It's down here. And where was it? Detroit? Macomb County. He thought the church van was in the parking lot. It was in Macomb County. Probably not picking up kids for church. All right? <laughs> So there's different instances like that where our, our church and, and our body of Christ, like we are going to suffer some persecution from the lost and we are going to suffer some persecution from the government when they tell us, here's what you can and can't do. Um, our, our free government here, we I have a lot of benefits that a lot of people don't. There are other forms of government where you cannot meet publicly, you cannot pass out uh, tracts, you cannot pass out anything that promotes Christ, and you could actually go to prison for that, or worse. Here in America, we don't feel the same oppression. I know during a certain period of time, during 2020 and 2021, there was a church, North Valley Baptist Church, Brother Jack Treber met him, great man, great ministry. They were getting fined tens and tens of thousands of dollars for meeting in their church building. They were following all the guidelines that were laid out, just like all the other businesses were. And they were, get, they were getting, I think, like $10,000. If they went the next Sunday, it would be $20,000. The next Sunday, $40,000. I think they had almost $100,000 worth of fines in like two months. They were following... The guidelines, they were following the Bible, they were doing what they thought was the right thing to do, but they were getting some form of persecution. Now it's not, when we think of persecution, sometimes we think of, you know, getting chained up and getting whipped and, you know, like the Apostle Paul, like he suffered some real persecution. But there are some instances where we will face some persecution. Can we go to the next slide, Brother Dave? Blessed are they... Um, which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Any loss that we're going to receive, any persecution that we're going to receive, any little bit of inconvenience that we receive here on earth really is going to pale in comparison to inheriting the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to read, if you want to flip actually forward, Matthew chapter 19. Let's flip forward, put our eyes on this together. Matthew chapter 19. In verse number 29. Give you a second to find it. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 29, and I'll read it. And for everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or fathers, or mothers, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. So here, Christ is saying, like, all of these, all of these physical blessing that you may have. All these physical things that we would consider a blessing from the Lord. Wife, children, lands, father, mother, sometimes that's not maybe a blessing. That was a joke. You can laugh. Anything that, we're, that we suffer or that we give up here in, in this earthly uh, life that we live, it really is going to pale in comparison. And Christ says that you'll receive a hundredfold of that once you get to heaven. And you'll get everlasting life as well. So we need to make sure that when we're receiving this persecution or some resistance when we're out uh, witnessing to people or if we're just minding our own business, um, acting in accordance to God's word, like in the definition there. We're just going about our basic lives as Christ would have us do, and we, re we get some persecution, some resistance. Do not get frustrated. Do not lash out at somebody because they treat you differently because you're a Christian or because you're trying to help them. Be merciful to them because 
when it's all said and done, Christ is going to repay a hundred times um, plus everlasting life when we get to heaven. So those are all of the B attitudes. I hope that I know I learned something. I hope that you learned something as well. The last uh, little bit of this lesson I want to talk about, ye are the salt and ye are the light. Ye are salt and ye are the light. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13. I'm going to read just verse number 13, and we'll read the other verses here in a second. So this is after we get past all the Beatitudes, and it talks about... Um, a little bit more about the being persecuted and being rejoicing and being glad for great is your reward in heaven. Verse number 12 says that. Then we move on to ye are the salt and ye are the light. Verse number 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt had lost his savor, wherein shall, salt be, wherein shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. A couple of quick thoughts here just from this couple, three verse, four verse um, little example that Christ used. Ye are the salt. Well, what does, what does salt do? Salt preserves, salt cleanses, and salt flavors. The, when the old timers needed to preserve something for a long time, a lot of times they would dry it out and they would have put a bunch of salt on it because it preserves it, keeps any bacteria out. Um, and in this, in our instance, our preservation with the salt would be we keep sin out of our lives and promote other people to keep sin out of their lives and to preserve them, to preserve them more than just in this life too, to preserve them everlasting, right? If we share Christ with them, they receive Christ, we just now preserve them for eternity. It cleanses as well. Salt is a cleanser. If you it would have a cut or a sore, a lot of times the old remedy would to put salt in the wound. Does that sting? Does it burn? Yes, it does. Could it save your life? Yes, it could because it cleanses. It gets the bacteria, any infection that could start, it keeps it out of it. Then it also flavors. Our, all of our food, if you go to a restaurant, your food's going to have salt on it, some form of salt. Even if you say no salt added, there's going to be salt in there somewhere, some form of sodium because it preserves and it also flavors something that has no salt on it, like vegetables. Vegetables with no salt are disgusting. <laughs> you got to have some salt on there or else it's not going to be palatable. My wife's laughing, but it's true, honey. Vegetables with no salt are disgusting. Okay, the world suffers from decay and it needs to be preserved. And our function is to help preserve the lost. And a danger that we can have is that the salt will lose its savor. Sometimes the salt can lose its effectiveness. If you just took your salt and you set it out, pretty soon it's going to turn into a block. So right there it's ineffective, like the Morton's uh, sodium. Like you always got to shake the can because it's all chunked up. Okay, it can become ineffective, it can become stale, it can become not salty anymore, and it's pretty much no good. If we just sit and absorb and absorb and absorb and we never go out and spread the little bit of the salt that needs to be spread, we're, we're going to come useless. We're going to lose its savor. We're going to be all blocked up, and we're not going to be effective. And God created light to shine. I'm going to read verses 14, 15, and 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We sing that song, let your light so shine before men. That's where this verse is found here in Matthew 5. Here Christ says, a man that lights a candle, he, he doesn't put a bushel over top of it. He puts it on a candlestick so it can shine out, right? All Christians are light, and God created light to shine. He didn't create you to get saved and then for all of us to hide inside this church because it's a safe place. There's other Christian brothers and sisters, and you know we all get along and we have our little thing, and we all just hide the light in here. No, we meet here, we learn from God's Word, we encourage each other, but then six out of seven days of the week, we're out, and we should be shining the light. We shouldn't hide the light. We shouldn't... When we run into somebody and have a conversation with them or our coworkers, and you mention like, oh, you know, I went to church on Sunday. Oh, well, I didn't figure you as a church going type. 
that should kind of be an insult. When they see you, they should see something different. If, they, if you mention that you go to church and they're surprised that you go to church, that may not be the best example, or, or maybe you haven't been shining your light. I, I don't think it's right to um, bombard people, like at your workplace, with um, church invites, with scripture, with arguments about scripture. I think that your life should be an example, and you should definitely share the gospel. But if your employer pays you to work, it is not, I, this is my opinion, okay? Don't write this down as gospel truth. It is not your place to promote anything. If you have like a side business, you shouldn't promote your side business at your workplace. You shouldn't necessarily be spending a lot of time promoting your church and stuff like that. I definitely think you should use your life as an example and share the gospel. This last place that I was just at, I straight up shared the gospel one-on-one -on -one with each one of my coworkers. Each one of them knows that Jesus Christ died for them, that they are sinners, and that the only way to get to heaven is through salvation in Jesus Christ and belief in him. I was able to do that just in the casual conversation that pops up. Oh, you know, what do you think about this? Oh, well, here, here's what my thoughts are on it. And you can share scripture with them. I definitely think you should let your light shine. I definitely don't think that you should go over and above because I don't feel like that's appropriate. But God created light to shine. And people are going to ask you questions when they see you. Well, why do you dress like that? You know, well, why don't you drink? Why don't you... Whatever it is, fill in the blank. Blank. Why do you go to church on Sunday? Then you can open up opportunities to let your light shine. God created light to shine. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and they glorify your Father which is in heaven. 